Hello, and welcome to Reflections. I am Rom Gaiozu, your host. So first and foremost, thank you very much for your being here with me and my guest today. I know your time is very important, and I'm the person who makes sure it is invested wisely. So today's show is going to be really, really fun and interesting because our topic is strategy, and I have someone who is an expert at strategy. So we're going to talk a little bit about trends and most importantly, opportunities and how to find them. So stay tuned. Uh, this show is going to be a lot of fun. So before uh, I get started, I actually have to cover some rules. Yes, everybody's got some rules. Uh, we got some too. So let me cover the uh, the rules and regulations regarding our Q&A first. So we really broadcast over a variety of different channels and they all have slightly different rules concerning the use of chat. And we're going to be making use of chat today. So therefore, we need to pay you know, close attention to those requirements. So the, all those rules can be summarized as follows. You know, just be nice, be polite, be courteous. There's only one, just one golden rule. There's absolutely no hate speech allowed. And by the way, uh, the chat boxes are all open. So please uh, take a moment to familiarize yourself with the chat. So uh, it can be called a chat box or a chat window. It really depends on the service you're using. So please do say hi and let me know where you're watching from. So for our podcast listeners and those uh, watching uh, through Futures Television, uh, please drop a comment on our YouTube page and I will address it. I do have a very, very special favor to ask of you. Since there are several chat windows running at the same time, it does save me quite a lot of time. If you could please just type hashtag ask, that is hashtag A, S, K, in front of your question. So this way, when I'm scrolling up and down and through the chats, I can spot your question and pose it to the guest immediately. So there are several ways for you to submit a question, of course. Uh, if you're live here with us, uh, you can use the chat. Uh, you can email me a question. Please email it to editor at imcimagazine.com. Or if you prefer to use the talk to text function, you can do so. Just text your question to 001 for the United States, 480-544-8372. So privacy rules. Do apply. I will not save your text or your number. Once it is read, it is deleted. And again, if you're following us through the recording, please use the YouTube channel. You can post over there and I will get to it uh, right away. So first order of business is to go through the agenda. Our agenda today seems short, but it's not. Uh, we're going to have a short introduction. I'm going to welcome a very, very special guest, Adam Harton. We're going to be talking to you about strategy, trends, uh, innovation, growth, how to spot trends, and most importantly, you know, how to take opportunity of them or how to position yourself in order to take opportunity of them. Uh, if you have any kind of, you know, last minute burning questions, please, uh, I saved some time towards the end of the show for additional Q&A. And then, of course, uh, at the very end, I will talk to you a little bit about upcoming events. And I hope uh, you're going to be back to see us and to participate in the dialogue. So uh, let's uh, do a little bit of the introduction. So we, Reflections, we are the podcast and live stream partner of IMCI Magazine. You can find us online at www.imcimagazine.com. We are an online publication here in the United States under registry 2769-0008. We are a member of Edelweiss America Media, and our focus is on intelligence. So competitive intelligence, market intelligence, economic intelligence, economic warfare, by the way. And a good chunk of the magazine is about foresight, future studies, and trends. Our vision is really to bring diverse perspectives and voices to the debate. What you see on the right-hand side of the picture is the cover of our latest issue, and we're focusing on openness and inclusivity. So I want to say a few words about the topic of the show today. So my guest today, Adam Harton, he's a recognized expert on trend analysis and innovation. 
two very important topics. We're going to go through quite a lot of change, and sometimes the future seems a bit blurry, or we feel intimidated, or even fearful of the future. So instead of worry, why not engage an expert, an expert such as my guest today, and start looking at trends and questioning how to position yourself to capitalize on them. I know it seems like a daunting test, but it is rather not. As soon as you hear from Adam Hartung himself, well, he has a gift for translating complexity into something we can use to our advantage. You will realize the future will happen whether we like it or not. So why not position yourself for gain? And I will ask him precisely that. So where can we find opportunities? We're, we're going to get there. <laughs> so luckily, my guest today mastered this subject, and he will be sharing some insights. Well, well, you, you get the idea. So uh, let's uh, get started. Let me pull a little bit on Adam so you can... Most of you already know him, but if you don't, it's my pleasure to say a few words about him. So my guest today, again, is Adam Hartung. He's the CEO of three companies, Content Laboratory, which is a content services company, Spark Partners, a growth strategy firm, and Sopar Film and Energy. So that is an oil, gas exploration, and production investment company. So in his career, he advised board of directors of several companies on strategy development, and he's very passionate about the importance of growth, innovation, and strategy to succeed. He also writes quite a lot. He is the founding editor of the International Journal of Innovation Science. He was the strategy and leadership columnist for a CIO magazine. And Forbes magazine recognized him as a top leadership columnist, for he wrote in excess of 400 columns for Forbes magazine over a period of 10 years. And those columns were read by over 100 million readers. His weekly podcast, the Business Trendsetter podcast, can be found at sparkpartners.com. And his blog is on Adam Hartung. Dot com. I invite you to visit his site and follow his podcast. And I will post the links in the comment section of this video below. So Adam is indeed a very, very busy person. And yet he found time to speak with us today. So uh, let's um, actually welcome Adam to the show. Hi, Adam. Thank you so very much for being here with us today. Hello, hello. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I know you're such a busy person and you actually found time uh, to be here. So let's let's get to business. And uh, my first question really goes to trends, right? In your most recent podcast, you talked about environmental awareness and the electrification of cars. Is this just a pipe dream or, or do you believe the adoption of passenger electric cars will indeed take off in, say, in the next uh, five or 10 years or so. Well, I think the sales of electric vehicles is already taken off. It's uh, going to look more like a, the old fashioned supersonic Concorde uh, than it's going to look than a train. They were already sitting there on uh, post launch on electronic vehicles. The technology has been around for 12 years, 13 years. Um, the uh, advantages of, of electrification are becoming clear to everyone, less maintenance, less fuel cost, um, better performance, especially in the short term. It's, it's already here and now it's just a matter of transitioning. Expect this to look like the transition from the old mobile phones to the to smartphones. You know, everybody had a mobile phone. They were nearly free. The provider gave them to you for nothing. You paid twenty dollars a month for service, and then smartphones came along. And even though the they were more expensive and the service was more expensive, they grew at a rate of thirty two percent per year over nine years. And we pretty much transitioned completely out of that, uh, out of the mobile phone to the smartphone in less than about eight to nine years. It happened, and I think that's what we're looking at for electronic vehicles right now. Wonderful. So, so let's uh, continue along uh, the same line. And I think it's important uh, for the audience to understand your thought process. So what kind of metrics or indicators um, should we be looking 
in order to establish, yes, yes, indeed, the transition from gas to electric powered cars is taking place either faster or slower. So what are we looking for? Is it like battery technology, uh, the engine, uh, the number of charging stations? So what are the metrics uh, we should be looking at? Well, it's adoption rate. That's the number one. Um, about 20 years ago, MIT raised something like $180 million in grant to try to do a study on how to predict the success of new ventures. And they looked across, I think it was over a thousand variables. I'm trying to remember the study now. And, uh, you know, leadership, the background of leadership, technology, patents, um, location, uh, just a whole lot of variables. And they said, you know, how could we predict the success of any new business or any new venture? And uh, at the end of this study, $180 million was spent. They came back and they said, you know, there was one variable that correlated extraordinarily high nothing else correlated you know they just couldn't be identified beyond random chance and the one variable that they picked was sales it was adoption rate if people bought it then things tend to get better and better and better and so uh, i get to ask this question a lot am i looking at technology adoption rates am i looking at inventions like you said in batteries, innovations that are happening. And I've after working at this for 40 years, one of the things I've learned is that it's important to have some understanding of the technology, but really what's important is to understand how is this being adopted? And if the adoption rates are coming along and people are actually using the new products, then what happens is it attracts money and, and the uh, purchase and use by leading individuals just bleeds into the purchase and use by other individuals and it builds up momentum and continues to grow. So so when I was looking at EVs, when Tesla was going public, you know, I was I was all in on that. I kept telling people they needed to go for it. And the auto industry was completely opposed to it. But the one thing that I could recognize was that Tesla sold every single car it made. When it was just a two-seater roadster vehicle, that's all they had, one vehicle that they could offer, they still every quarter sold every single car they made. And as they expanded, went to Model S, and added you know, the Model 3 and other vehicles, they always were able to sell every single car they made. So even though Volkswagen makes 10 million cars a year and I think General Motors makes 12 million cars a year, they're making vastly more product. Reality is that Tesla kept selling every single car they made. So that just tells you the adoption rate, the demand, the, the, the hunger that people had for that type of a solution. So that's one of the things we can look at now is we have a track record of 15 years of Tesla selling every single car they made every single quarter. And the only question could be, could you make more of them and how fast can you make them? This last quarter, we, they sold 87% higher cars than they did a year before. They're doubling their rate of sales. This is just telling you that you know, the market out there is far from being reached, that there's just a a lot more demand than there is supply. Yeah, okay. So adoption rate is the one we should be uh, looking at. Now, uh, can you help us uh, think through this? Okay. So what are the implications of this transition to electrification and how can we benefit from this trend? So where entrepreneurs can find those opportunities? What are the opportunities uh, that you believe uh, will be out there or available? How do we position ourselves to take benefit of this trend? Well, there's a couple of opportunities that entrepreneurs would look at very quickly. Uh, one of the first ones would be being a supplier to the industry. Uh, this industry, the electronic vehicle business right now is not a Detroit or, a, you know, it's not dominated by the traditional players. So consequently, you have new companies and new locations that are looking for suppliers. They need all kinds of components. Uh, you know, you, you don't break an electric car the way you break a traditional car. Speed control is done differently because you have electric motors, multiple electric motors in some instances, and no trans, uh, transmission historical. So you've got all these new kinds of, of products. What they need is the products need to be made. So there's manufacturing opportunities and development opportunities. How can you be better at making the electric car uh, an improved vehicle? So anything you do in componentry that would go to insist in that will be a good move in the right direction. The second thing is the realizing that you have this this issue of charging stations. Uh, people do have range anxiety, although that's been diminished considerably in the last two years with most vehicles doing 400 to 500 miles per charge, but there's still an insufficient number of charging stations. So there's a big business to be built there. Uh, we're gonna be seeing literally hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of charging
charging stations installed in just the next few years. So that's everything from finding a location, installing it, putting in charging stations, figuring out how many ports to put on it, and then charging people for the charge. That's one option. Another one is looking at parking lots where you had charging stations, looking at how you could put charging stations at retailers to try to attract uh, people to come to the store, um, our office buildings to get people to rent those office buildings. You know, where could you try to put locations that are dedicated, alternative locations, home locations, the charging station business is just going to be, you know, a really, really high growth business. And that, that's a free for all right now. There's no model, uh, economic model right now that's proven out to be the one winning model. There's no, you know, there's a lot of people getting at, into it in different ways, everything from making the components to building out the stations with different business models that are associated with them. So that's another tremendous opportunity. And then there's going to be the whole decommissioning opportunity. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of gas stations in the United States are going to go away. What's going to happen to that real estate? So we've got to decommission those, pull those tanks out of the ground, clean them up, figure out how we're going to deal with the waste product. And then we got the, the retail location itself, right? Are we going to, are those going to become charging stations? Not inherently does it need to be so. They could become many things. Well, what do you want to do with that space? Um, looking at that, you know, this is an opportunity to perhaps acquire a thousand locations at a time and, you know, from somebody that's operating them as gas stations and figuring out something to do to do with them or as few as a handful at a time. Right. So those are just some of the opportunities that are going to be provided to uh, to us just over the next five years. Wonderful. So um, I just want to uh, translate everything again, what you just said. So first we're looking at real numbers right sales sales volumes of uh, passenger electric cars are taking off okay this is this is the indicator then you said okay uh, look at the the thing the making of the thing right the electric car the components and all the piece parts that go along with the piece parts then the use of the thing how we use it and then oh well well we don't put gas in it anymore well we use electricity and then you said well now the usage model is different now we require electricity and then you see well how does it change the physical location so we no longer need gas stations now we need charging stations so it's all about the usage model and, and this is basically how you think through it okay this is the thing uh what goes into the thing how we use it and how it transforms the environment around us and that's really how we can think about uh, finding opportunities right yes Okay, wonderful. So uh, next, I want to ask you a different kind of trend. So, uh, well, the first one we talked about is, okay, electrification of cars. So you, you actually used a, a big umbrella talking about environmental awareness. Uh, uh, maybe can you explain to us what other trends uh, did you spot or what are you looking at right now? Did you say, well, environmental awareness is just one, but maybe there are others? Well, I always like to help people understand that when you're doing your planning, don't try to look at too many mega trends because um, you, you've got to go develop scenarios. And if you're looking, you know, mega trends have uh, cascading trends that get closer and closer to what you're doing on a daily basis. So the environmental awareness is a mega trend. What we're seeing is, you know, the ESG movement in terms of investing, it's pulling lots of money. Um, you mentioned Soprafilm Energy. I started that company 15 years ago uh, to do fracking in Texas. And at that time it was easy to raise money to frack wells in order to try to get them rejuvenated and flowing again. Uh, if I was to put together a fund to try to say, I want to go frack wells, I couldn't raise a dime today. And it wouldn't, it'd be a non-starter just because of the pollution effects of fracking and nobody wants to be in that business whereas if I said I was putting together a business to go build out charging stations I'd get a lot of interest that's environmental investing that's ESG that's and that applies to entrepreneurs if you've got a business that's going to reduce the amount of water that's used in a manufacturing process or a food process anything like that then that, that kind of a mega trend around environmental awareness will get you more attention and help get you more money paying attention to packaging uh, you know people are going to be in Europe already, we have a lot of rules around, you know, cradle to grave. If you create the packaging, you've got to get it back or you have to pay a, a tax on top of it. I don't know that the U.S. will move towards regulating packaging, but we see 
people paying attention, right? They're paying attention to what kind of, is it a plastic bag? Is it a paper bag? How much packaging is there in this? What am I throwing away? You know, can I get the product without so much packaging? Can I get the product with environmentally uh, friendly packaging? The, the, these are opportunities that are just going to, that are out there waiting to happen. If you can figure out how to package something up better than the other guy with a more environmentally friendly product, then you should be going after it because people selling the end-use products are looking for those kinds of solutions. So that's a big category when you talk about environmental awareness, right? It gets into autonomous processes, autonomous manufacturing, and even autonomous car operations come from this goal of being more environmentally friendly. So you take one big mega trend and start building out what the opportunities are. But the second one that I would tell everybody to pay attention to right now for the next decade, because it's going to be big for the next 20 years, is demographics. Um, we're right now, uh, you know, again, talking about something that's that's been coming at us. The demographic shift has been coming at us about the speed of a, of a battleship or the, the speed of an oil tanker, just slowly moving forward. But, but we could see it coming, the aging of the population in the developed world. And we're ready to the point that there's only three people working in Japan for every retiree. And it's causing huge impact on the young people of Japan trying to produce enough economic uh, development in order to keep the country moving forward when there's so many retirees. Uh, China's got this problem in spades, right, because of the one-child policy under Chairman Mao. Um, Germany had this problem in spades until it did two things. It acquired Eastern Germany, and then it opened up the doors for the highest level of immigration of any country in Eastern Europe. So we see that this is a this aging of the population is something that's post-World War II. It's been easily visible. It's been very predictable, and now it's coming to roost. It's going to have a huge impact, and that's true in America as well. And so what is demographics going to do for us? Well, you know, we're getting older and we're going to get more colorful as a country. And looking at that, we start saying, you know, you know, the argument about immigration, for example, should we or should we not have immigration? Well, you know, I'll say it's going to get very practical very soon as we have more and more retirees. The number of people that are working per person that's not working will decline. You, you can solve that problem with immigration. So I think that's probably a, a you know, foregone conclusion that we will improve or increase the level of immigration into the country over the next decade. But beyond that is services, health care. You know, an aging population means more health care. It means everything from more biopharmaceutical solutions to pharmaceutical solutions to things like what kinds of beds are we going to have? Are our beds in our homes going to look like the ones we've traditionally had? Or are they going to look more like a bed that's in a, in a, in a hospital? How do we get around? You know, a decade ago, um, I thought it was a, you know, interesting that I would see an electric uh, little cart type vehicle on the back of an SUV going down the road. It was sort of a rare occurrence. Today, I never go out on the street that I don't see at least one vehicle, usually an SUV with one of those electric carts on the back of it, right? Um, ads, we see them all the time on television now for walk-in bathtubs. This is all related to the aging population. There's tremendous, again, just a huge number of opportunities. The kinds of homes we live in, right? Multi-story versus single story. Um, the, the location of those homes, the size of those homes. It's one thing to take care of a 6,000 square foot house when you've got a family of five and you're 45 years old. It's another thing to try to take care of a 6,000 square foot house when you're 78, right? So we have all of these are going to be, these are very predictable. They're unstoppable. Both of these megatrends, the changing the demographics and the um, environmental awareness, are, are they're unstoppable. They're going to affect our entire, every business for the next 20 years. So the thing to do is to say, how can I take advantage of that? How can I look for those opportunities and see my path to growth? Wonderful. And those are uh, indeed uh, wonderful opportunities. And thank you for my, much uh, for uh, pointing them out. Now, is there anything that uh, worries you when you look at all those trends? Uh, what is that you would say, well, that worries me or that's worrisome? Are you, are you talk to so many of Fortune 500 companies out there what is it that keeps uh, people uh, up at night? What kind of, is there one thing that we say, ah, that worries me and we should watch this carefully? Well, uh, the field of business strategy was founded around 1980 with the Michael Porter book, Competitive Strategy. There really was no such thing as business strategy. Uh, the, you know, McKinsey, Bain, BCG were all birthed around this time, you know, late 1970s, 1980s, when that book came out. Almost all of that early work from, from mid-70s up all the way well into the 2000s was around operational excellence. And, you know, we went through all kinds of TQM quality programs. We went through the lean management program. 
all of those approaches are basically around how do I do what I've always done better, faster, cheaper? How do I lower my costs? How do I automate processes? How do I use artificial intelligence to make decisions that are, you know, repetitive decision making done more effectively? So that's been the focus where a lot of people have been. And a lot of leaders today came up through that approach. And, and that's highly problematic. Because when the world is changing around you, like I'm talking about, you know, by the year 20, 30, 100 percent of the cars in California, uh, the new cars sold in California be electric. Now, when you look at that and you say, OK, that is going to change a lot of stuff. The people that are indoctrinated in more, better, faster, cheaper don't have the tools. You know, it's one thing for me to sit there and tell somebody, you know, at, at, at a, that owns, say, Arco with all of those gas stations out there and mini marts and those kinds of things. It's one thing for me to say it's going to be electrified, but the, the leadership, if they don't have any tools to know how to make those changes, they're going to say, yeah, OK, yeah, but they're not going to do anything. They'll talk about it. They may hire some consultants to drop some ideas, but they won't do anything. And the same thing happens with people, unfortunately. People live in a place, they have a job, they do something. And, and a lot of times this changes that we're going through, all these new things that are coming along. People are saying, gosh, it's coming at me too fast. I'd like to freeze things in place and then just let it stay there, right? And, and, I, and, I, and so they fight against the change. They, they actually take action to try to freeze things in place. It reminds me of when I was young and uh, somebody would go get a haircut and they'd say, oh, man, I, I love how my hair looks right now. I just wish I could hold it, you know, and, and my hair wouldn't grow anymore. So I'd, I could look like this all the time. And it's just a preposterous statement. Your hair is going to grow at whatever rate it's growing, right? And you're going to have to constantly maintain it. That's what we have to do with our businesses. We have to constantly maintain. And our lives are the same way. So we have to constantly grow. We have to constantly move forward. If we don't, then what happens is we get stuck in a bygone era and we're not able to communicate effectively. We're not able to work effectively and things get bad. So right now, the, I would say that this, this notion of some call the conservative movement, some call it, there's a lot of names for it. But the thought that what happens is we, we don't really want to move forward. We don't really want this change. You know, we somehow want to freeze things in place is really, really something to be worried about. Now, now the thing is, because we don't believe it. At the end of the day, when you go and you, if you're feeling sick and you show up at the hospital, you show up at a doctor's office, you want them to do something to make you feel better. So you, you don't want improvement in healthcare to stop, right? You, 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 want, you want things that are going to make you feel better. They want things that are going to make you healthy. So we want that at the end of the day, but it's the process of getting there that scares people so badly that they like try to put things in place policies, regulations, business procedures, business policies to stop that forward movement. And that's that's just deadly. It, it'll kill the business. And if you do it as an individual, it'll eventually kill you. Well, actually, uh, you mentioned healthcare, and we have a question um, exactly um, about that. So uh, on one hand, there's a lot of people who say, well, we want more time with the doctors, right? And then there's this whole new trend about virtual healthcare. So uh, what's your, your view on virtual healthcare services here to stay, to grow? Is, are we going to go back? What do you think? Um, okay. Again, look at trends and look at adoption rates. Um, it, if you wind back the clock to about 1965, we were graduating about 10,000 medical doctors a year in the United States. We were graduating about that many lawyers and about that many MBAs. Today, we graduate about 100,000 lawyers a year, and we graduate about 300,000 MBAs a year. We graduate about 12,000 doctors a year. All right. So clearly, what we're looking at is an inability to produce enough new physicians to keep up with the population growth. So for years, people have talked about, could, you know, do I have to go to a doctor? Do I have to go to their office? You know, how do, we, how do doctors interact with patients? How much time do they spend with patients? And there's been a lot of talk about, well, let's, you know, why couldn't I um, interact with my physician through some kind of, you know, more phone call use or more video technology, that sort of thing. And the really obstacle along the way have been insurance companies, uh, you know, just getting on the practical stuff, like, you know, somebody putting a rule in place. And in this case, if, a, if I went to see a doctor in his office, that was an office visit, check the box, a certain amount of money got paid to that physician, let's say $125. If he took a phone call, check a box, he got paid $15. 
And so what happened was the physician was encouraged to have the office visit because if he spent 10 minutes on the phone or 10 minutes in the office, there was a huge price differential in the two. And the same thing then starts happening of, now how many people can I see in the office? Because I'm getting $125 a visit, now I want to churn as many people in the office as I can. So this payment system that was created by the insurance companies started driving behavior, and, and that continued. We're in a good position now where the pandemic is breaking a lot of that, okay? It's not breaking the insurance companies, but it's changing the way the insurance companies have to operate because we simply couldn't do this stuff. At the same time that we've got that system now changing dramatically, we have the growth of the wearables market. So in addition to interactive technology like we have here with the, you know, with the Zoom type of, a, of a interactions, video conferencing, we now have you know, interactive uh, or wearable items, everything from a watch to you know, blood meter readers to heart meter readers and all kinds of wearables. So what we're looking at is a future in which the diagnostic data can be accumulated remotely. You don't have to go to a facility to get the diagnostic data. This is even gonna start including imaging where we'll be able to do more imaging technology in our homes using devices, you know, mobile devices and, and PC-like devices. So the diagnostic data can come into a location. The physician can look at that. That allows them to look at more data more quickly. Then the interaction can start happening like we're having the interaction now. We can replace the office visit. This will improve the amount of time that the physician can spend with the patient. Because now what happens, they can do the diagnostic effort, they can have the discussions, then they can sit down with the patient and be dedicated to talking to the patient. Instead of asking a lot of questions to get the diagnostic data, then having to go away and do the diagnostics and then come back, the diagnostics get accumulated, they get reviewed by the physician and the specialist, then we get together and we talk about care program, treatment program, uh, the, the lifestyle that the patient has and how to try to fit the care treatment program into that, use of additional wearables and other technology to improve the quality of life of the patient. Those kinds of discussions now become much more plausible and we start paying appropriately to the professionals so that they can have these discussions. You know, what I think we'd all be happier to spend 15 minutes with a physician in a Zoom discussion than to drive to the office to spend five minutes in an interactive discussion face to face. The quality of that, <laughs> you're going to get much more out of the interactive discussion that you had using the, the, uh, the digital technology. So it's pretty clear where the trends are. It's pretty clear where they're headed. And I think we're all really benefiting from this sort of uh, fracture that's happened in the payment system through the pandemic. You know, the, 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 the fact that the pandemic shut everything down, it's caused this sort of uh, change in behavior in terms of how much we can travel. It's caused an overload on the healthcare system. It's really forcing the payments mechanism to change. And I think that's the last step in terms of breaking this wide open and making it much more of a virtual type world. And to me, I, I have to be careful about this word virtual. To me, if I'm there's a the very virtual part of medicine is going to be when I'm talking to a doctor that's an AI that the, the the screen I'm looking at or I'm interacting with is is more of a it's a character it's not a living breathing human it's a programmed character that's having a discussion with me using artificial intelligence now that's real virtual medicine are we headed in that way absolutely Absolutely. We can, the more we can take diagnostic data, analyze the data, the more we can feed that into AI systems that can then be, become a, a stepchild so that you have the remote experience, then you can have the artificial intelligence experience that can move you further along. And then we get to the, the physician. You know, if, if a problem can be solved by repetitive review, then artificial intelligence will solve that problem. You know, where humans sit in is when you need ingenuity. It's when it's non-repetitive. It's when it's a break in the um, in the repetitive nature of the decision-making process. That's when humans have high value. And, and given that we have so few physicians per people in the population, we're constantly putting the physician more towards we want the physician involved when ingenuity is required, when thinking is required, when one plus one plus one doesn't quite come up to three. It's something slightly different, and somebody needs to get involved in that. So I want to be careful how we use the word virtual medicine. I think what we're going to see is a series of steps. Remote is going to become much more common. We are going to see a lot more use of artificial intelligence in the diagnostics and in the accumulation and analysis of the diagnostics. And then we're going to see more remote in interactions with physicians and professionals as we uh, move forward. Wonderful. Actually, uh, they, they love their answer. I told you Adam would have answers for you. Uh, so, by the way, so let me make sure that my phone is off. So maybe in, in the future, I am on the not disturbed, by the way. I can only see text. 
I will say, Alexa, I have a chest pain. And Alexa is going to say, what are your symptoms and blah, blah, blah. So I think that that's where we're going, virtual diagnostics and virtual treatment. Well, I think, yeah, it's, it, if you, again, there's no reason for a perfectly healthy person to wear a, a, a Fitbit watch or one of these data accumulators unless they want to for their own personal, you know, it's interesting to them. We don't need to put these on everybody. But as you age, there's a need to do more monitoring. And the, the good news is, is that these tools are coming along very quickly. The good thing about these tools is that that accumulates data. When we accumulate data, we now have the machines to analyze data. I mean, roll back the clock 100 years, and you, if you had a giant mound of data, how could you analyze it? You know, were you going to literally pull out pieces of paper and create giant spreadsheets? You know, that, how do we get data? How can we analyze it? There were a lot of limits on that. With, with the computing technology we have today, the more data we accumulate, the more we can analyze it, the more we can start to see patterns. So machine learning comes along. Machine learning is very beneficial. So, you know, you can start saying to somebody, look, if you're 65 years old, the probability of having a heart problem is, you know, uh, to 14, 15 percent. It's a choice. Would you like to have your heart monitored with a fairly, you know, a device that doesn't really get in the way of your daily living? And then it will collect a lot of data and tell you if your risks are changing. Or do you not want to wear this type of device? Do you not want to go through this kind of monitoring? But as you age, more of it will become more natural. If you happen to be, have, you know, an illness of some kind, you know, you, 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 you acquire cancer, then you might want to be monitored. If you, you know, if you've got multiple sclerosis, you could be monitored. So, what we're seeing is that it's going to make the practice of medicine extraordinarily different, the practice of healthcare quite a bit different, because we'll be able to accumulate the data, analyze the data, apply machine learning and artificial intelligence to know what that data means, and put people in the position of providing healthcare, right? Instead of spending a lot of time on data accumulation, analysis, and diagnostics, we'll get a lot more of that up, and now it'll be the brain power, the ingenuity of the, of the healthcare provider. How can I make your life better? What would it do to help your life? You know, do you need some kind of assist in your life? Do you need medicine? Do you need biopharmacal solutions? What, what do you need? And you can have that discussion so that the patient gets what they need to live the life that they want. And I think everybody comes out a big winner at the end of the day. Yeah, so more opportunities. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, next question, and I know you're very passionate about growth. So uh, we're going through a period of, volatility you know there's a lot of uncertainty inflation is at a record high we're still dealing with the pandemic uh, we have elections in the us so that might change the balance of power so in this uncertain or very uncertain environment i should say what kind of advice do you offer or, or what strategy uh, can firms adopt uh, again to help them in put them in the path for growth um, the question is, uh, is there a path to growth uh, in such an uncertain environment? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uncertainty uh, in, in terms of outcomes doesn't mean that trends won't hold. It just it, it affects the specific route to, towards those trends. You know, we've been we've been on a work from home trend for 40 years. Uh, you know, people have taken work, home, and done things and come back. And every year it's gotten a little easier, gotten a little easier, gotten a little easier. Well, what happens was the pandemic hit and then work from home became much more the norm. And now we're transitioning to that very, very quickly. Right. So we can look at those sort of factors and we say you know are there uncertainties yes but the uncertainties are around speed not not the not the end game it's easy to sit there and you know if i tell people do you think we'll have an all-electric fleet at some fleet at some point in the future the answer is always yes okay the only discussion is how quickly do you think cars will be self-driving at some point in the future i mean if planes can self-operate then certainly a car could right it should be less complicated so people are like yeah i think that could happen okay now we've agreed on what's going to happen the question is how fast is it going to happen so the, the, i think we need to start recognizing that these future scenarios a lot of times it's not that hard to figure out what they're going to be we just start talking about how fast will it happen then if we're going to take it takes our 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 insides would like it to be slow because we have to grow as people. We have to understand what's going on. What are these new things? And then we have to adjust and we have to move for them. So inside us, a lot of us would say, I hope it doesn't happen too quickly. I'm happy enough driving my car because what, why I'm uncertain what a car, this autonomous car future thing is going to look like. So since I'm uncertain, I hope it happens slowly. 
But on the other side, the technologies are improving. People are trying to make it happen. And there are a lot of folks that think they can see the future where there's going to be a lot fewer car accidents. There'll be a lot fewer problems, you know, broke down on the side of the road. All those things could start to go away. We could get away from having to have so many cars and garages, wasting the garage, you know, wasting what could be livable space. There's a place to house a garage right now. We could move to fewer cars. So they're constantly working on making it happen quickly. So we have people that are kind of resistant and they're saying, oh, I hope it goes slow because I'm not ready for it. Then you have people saying, I hope it happens fast because we've got the technology. We're trying to bring it together. What we've learned over the last 200 years, ever since we, you know, before industrial, industrial movement, is that the ones who are trying to make it happen win. You know, once somebody figures out how to go out and, and collect up grain with an automated uh, device, you don't do it by hand anymore. Right. Once you're able to separate the grain from the stock with a uh, with a tool, you don't do it by hand anymore. When you can drive uh, spikes, railroad spikes with a mach machine, you don't need John Henry wielding a hammer anymore. Right. And so you can't stop that. You can't stop the technology in the field of progress, because as soon as it works and it's better, then it's going to be adopted. And the people that move quickly towards that. They tend to get the most success. They tend to have the greatest profitability. Those who delay and take their time get washed away. Some of them never make the transition. Some of them make the transition, but it's too late and they never really catch up and there aren't any profits left in it anymore. So the, the reality is we know what the future is going to look like in a lot of these instances. We're just reluctant to accept it. Once we accept it and we get some commitment around it, then it's a matter of, okay, what do I need to learn? I used to have this sign on my desk that said, stupid is forever, but ignorance can be fixed. And that's true. Mostly when we're scared about the future, it's based upon what we don't know. We can fix what we don't know. We can read. There's more. You know, one time it was hard to go get information. You had to go find an expert and, and have them tell you, or you had to go buy books and read them. And, you know, you know well, how do I get the information I want? Today, we've got a device in our hands every day that can answer millions and millions of questions as quickly as we can ask the question, right? So we can learn. We can learn more quickly than we ever had in the past. We just got to keep realizing we have to grow. You have to grow because if you don't keep growing, then you get stuck. And when you get stuck, you get trampled. Wow. That was really very interesting because I, I think it's important that people hear from you that kind of message because I deal with a lot of folks who are, you know, worried. They're worrisome. They're uncertain. So what you're saying is, folks, change is happening. Change will happen. It's just a matter of when or how fast we get there. So let's, let's position ourselves. So I have a follow-up question to you on, on precisely that. And, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I want to go back because I get this question very often. So uh, back to trends, and I want to talk to you about uh, the future of work. And you, you made a statement once. You said, if the process is consistent, expect robotization. If it's binary, expect machine learning. And if ingenuity is not high, expect AI. So what is in store for the future of the American worker? <laughs> okay, so we went through the process in the agrarian era. Uh, people need to remember, it's 150 years ago, 95 out of 100 people worked in agriculture, right? Because it just took all these people to collect up the food, process it, get it to us to eat. As we learned how to automate that, right, then what happened was people moved into the industrial era. So then we put people into factories. And you have all these old images of people making things on factory assembly lines, right? But then we figured out how to roboticize that, and the number of people we needed in factories went away. We became clerical workers, right? So the white-collar jobs exploded. So as we moved into the white-collar jobs, now we have people pushing paper around, right? Think of accounts, bookkeepers, uh, sales reporting, all these kinds of things. But then we learned how to automate that, right? We get uh, all kinds of software technology that can uh, accumulate the data, process the data. So we don't need people in those jobs anymore. So what we see is that as time goes along, it keeps pressuring us that we have to be using our minds, right? We have to be out there solving real problems. Because if the problem can be solved through something that's repetitive, then what happens is we can have a machine figure out how to do that. And when I say a machine, I'm including obviously computers in that the definition of a machine. And so we're constantly making better tools. Uh, if, if Just keep going back to the concept of tools. Anytime you have a tool, 
then you don't need the person as much human effort involved. And that's a good thing. That's productivity, right? And so we keep improving and improving our tools. And that's the, the future of work lies in that area of understanding that you have to be in the, out there adding value on top of the tool. You either, and that, is, that can involve making better tools as well, by the way, and improving tools. But the human involvement has to be improving beyond the tool. If there's a tool that can do the job, then that will do the job. It will not be a person doing the job. So there's a problem in that people look at work and they often look at the work around them today or they might look a couple years back. But, and I, I feel bad sometimes when I'm talking to college students and I'm telling them, listen, what you have to do is think about what's the world going to look like in 30 years, right? And in 30 years, you want to be positioned that you're adding value 30 years in the future, that you're bringing something to that game because you're graduating from college at 22 years old. It's going to, in 20 years, you're going to be 42, Right. And, and you're going to have a, a child or two possibly in the house and all that. And you're going to have another 10, 15 years. That's where you really got to be positioned to add a lot of value. So the fact that you could do something today may not have value then. I, I went through a long period of time where people were graduating from college and getting Microsoft certified to go work in IT departments. And I would just sit there with them and say, be careful here. I mean, getting Microsoft certified to be very good at running servers inside of small corporations or, or even big corporations is cool today. But are you building up the skill set when that no longer is going to be necessary? And they would look at me and scratch their head and I'd say, look, this, this, these servers that we got in these companies, they are going to go away. That's going to be replaced by the next wave of technology. Are you learning things as a person? Are you learning how to add value so that when those servers go away, you, you're ready for the next phase? You're ready for the next thing you're going to do? And that's the part that that's where we are in the field of work. So where where am I going to add value out there in the future? What is it I'm going to be doing? You know, at one point you could make money working a shovel, digging a ditch. Maybe you could do that in some parts of the undeveloped world today or the underdeveloped world. But generally today, you're, you're going to have to be operating a machine that's digging the ditch, right? And increasingly that machine's going to get intelligent and it's going to be able to go out and dig the ditch without anybody there even beside the machine. So the future of work is rapidly continuing down this road that it's been on from, for 200 years, which is getting away from manual labor, getting away from our involvement in doing the work, and in terms of running the machines, operating the tools. And that's going to head, keep, continue to head in that direction. And so people are just going to have to keep thinking. You're going to have to keep growing. You're going to have to keep learning in order to be able to add value every year as, as the world progresses. Good. So it's all about the thinking and the adding value. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it's kind of fun that people watch sports. Um, I think sports are a nice getaway. I uh, don't have anything opposed to sports. But, you know, what's interesting that, uh, that I think almost all the people that are over 45, let me say all the people over 60 for sure, maybe a lot of the people over 45, I'd say, I'd say what's the number one fastest growing sport in the world? And I do this in front of groups a lot. And a lot of times I get the answer, soccer, that, you know, American football. Or, I'm sorry, um, what's called football worldwide. Or I get American football. I get these sort of traditional answers. The number one fastest growing sport in the world is video gaming, without a doubt. <laughs> the highest paid athletes in the world are gamers, video gamers. There's no doubt about this. There's no question about this. When I tell people you know, in their 50s and these, or that there are – that, you know, that, that young people pay vast sums of money to go sit in an auditorium and watch someone play a video game, then these older people will scratch their heads and just be amazed. And I'm kind of like, I don't know why you're amazed. What They're telling you something. They're telling you that they love sports, but not the way you think of it. You think of it as a physical exercise, somebody shooting a basketball kind of thing. To them, it's become this more virtual world, and they interact with that virtual world. And they could be the person shooting the basket. You know, and they could be the one playing the game, even if they've never had those manual skill sets. That's what gaming allows them to do. And gaming allows them to a whole lot of ways to explore their minds and, and expand and grow their minds. So what we've done is even sports has moved away from this idea of, you know, just being manual. Uh, the tenants at NFL, Major League Baseball, uh, National Hockey League, the tenants of all those sorts of sports are declining. And they're all struggling. Why? Well, because that's locked into a set of rules and a way of competition that's now outdated. 
Mm-hmm. Younger people want more involvement. You know, I, I ask people, could you imagine a, a, a future of football where one out of every four plays is fed out from the internet, where the fans are feeding information into a computer system, and it's and it's going to tell the coach what plays. You could even have a fan-based coach. You could have a computer that's out on the side. All the fans could be feeding in information, and it could be calling the plays out on the field. It could be real-time interactive in, in, with a human football team still playing and undertaking the, 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 the plays. But that's the future. That's where we're headed. It really is about interaction, and it's about our growth and our ability and using these tools, and it is becoming increasingly a much more mental exercise. Good. So um, I wanted to change subjects a little bit and ask you about Spark Partners. So um, literally, you gave over you know one thousand you know speeches or presentations. You know over one hundred million people read your stuff. Yet on your own site, you highlighted two things. You highlighted the Phoenix Principle, and you highlighted the Status Quo Risk Management Playbook. So out of all things you talk about, you highlighted those two. Why? Well, let's start with the, the latter, the, the status quo risk management playbook. The, what uh, people think of, often don't think of risk the way risk really exists, okay? So they'll say, um, what, you know, what's riskier? And it will be based upon their knowledge. You know, so somebody will say, I, I don't know anything about how to op- drive a car on the left with the right hand steer. So therefore, I think it's risky to drive a car with the right hand steer. Well, once you get experience with it, it's definitely not any more risky to be right hand steer than it is to be left hand steer. Right. So the, the point of this is to say you live in a status quo and around you, you see things and you think things are risky. But your perception of risk is based upon what you know. And so you often don't get the perception right. You think something's risky when it's really not risky, okay? And so what's happening is that the longer this goes on, you're looking at the status quo, you build up what's called status quo risk. And it's that the risk that because you see the world from an internal perspective, you don't understand the real risk. So you don't understand the risk that's being built up in your world. You get very comfortable saying, okay, today was okay. Yesterday was okay. I'm sure tomorrow will be okay. And that's sort of going through day after day after day, doing the same thing without incorporating external inputs creates this status quo risk. And so the playbook is you sit down and say, instead of looking at our business internally and feeling comfortable about what we do, we have to start saying, what are the risks to the status quo? How are big changes in demographics and environmental awareness and all these uh, you know, things we're talking about today and about how people are changing new technologies, healthcare, all these things that are coming along. How does that create a risk on my business as it exists today? Right. We need to assess the risk in a very real way, not from how we feel about it and not from an inside out perspective, but from an outside in perspective right? Start collecting external data and applying that to say, how will that change our world? How will that make it different? So that's the status quo risk management playbook. The second one is the Phoenix principle. And and so what struck me back about the turn of the century was that I had been a strategist for a long time. And yet we knew around the turn of the century that there was no statistical greater, there was no improved statistical probability of success if you hired a McKinsey or a BC, Boston Consulting Group, BC There was no, that did not assure your future. And that was kind of ridiculous. Here for at least 25 years, we've been paying these firms millions of dollars to do strategy work for their clients. And yet there was no statistical evidence that they had done any good at all. I thought that was extraordinarily damning. I mean, just, uh, you, and then you had all these other companies that you know, McKinsey was certainly into a bigot and migrated into a Booz Allen and Hamilton. You had no shortage of people getting into this business yet. There was no statistical evidence that they did their clients any good. And so what I, that's what launched off really where my career is now, what I focus on. So what was wrong? And what we learned was that the, the practice of strategy was internally focused. It was better, faster, cheaper. It was how do I you know, do cost curves and how do I build boats around my business and all these things that we're trying to do to defend and extend the past. To try to say, what am I good at and how do I defend what I'm good at and how do I try to extend what I'm good at in a world that's changing, Right. Pretending, for example, like it'll never change. It's like being in a newspaper and saying, hey, 
I want to keep having a great newspaper. I want to have great news and it'll be wonderful. And ignoring the fact that, you know, your, your advertisers are all going to new places. You know, the, 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 the uh, classified ad business is going off to Craigslist and the, 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 the ads for uh, cars are going off to uh, car websites. You know, it, you're not looking at the outside world. And so, you know, the newspaper just collapses. Right. And so that's, again, status quo risk had built up. And I said, we need a new approach to that. And that's the Phoenix principle. And the Phoenix principle uh, starts off with saying that, you know, you have to be looking externally. You know, your strategic planning should be out, outwardly focused, not inwardly focused. It's, it's accumulating external data. And, and the second thing is recognizing that you really have to be obsessive about fringe competition. You know, the, the little guys that you want to ignore, you know, like a newspaper looking at Craigslist in the year 2000, it's easy to ignore. But what could it become? You don't really have to be obsessive about what will this become? What will the little thing become? And, you know, they'll often say, you know, well, it, this that would have to happen and that would have to happen. And then somebody would say, well, yeah, if pigs could fly. And they'd be like, no, we're not talking about flying pigs here. We're talking about reality and things will improve. So you have to be second obsessive about the competition. The third is you have to be willing to be disruptive. And this is often hard for people because we're taught at a young age, don't be disruptive. If you're sitting in a classroom, it's don't be disruptive. One of the things I love about remote learning, which I think is fantastic, is that each student gets to go at their own rate. And so they're not sitting in a class perhaps behind the group and therefore they're making disruptive behavior because they're not keeping up. They're not way ahead of the group and therefore having disruptive behavior because they're ahead of the group. Remote learning allows people to learn together. But historically, what we've done is we've packaged people into groups. And then what we've told them is don't be disruptive. The reality is, is that the successful people are disruptive. They come up with new ideas. They get outside the box and think, you know, and they, they drive towards growth. And so you have to be willing to be disruptive. You have to start saying disruption is a good thing. I have to disrupt my patterns. I have to disrupt my belief structure. I have to disrupt my biases in order to be more successful. And so you take a look at all the disruption Amazon has been through over the last 30 years, right? It disrupted its way of operating as much as it disrupted how we buy things and how we use computers, you know, how we think about shipping and freight and just, you know, they've disrupted those things. And that's what, that's good. Disruption is good. So you have to be externally focused on your data collection. You have to be willing to look at the little guys and think about how things can work. And then you have to be disruptive for the first three steps. And then to keep yourself alive, you have to have some white space in your life. You have to have some white space in your company. And white space is the, the no rules space. It's where you say, I'm going to do something new, something that I haven't done before. And I'm going to try to see, I'm going to learn. I'm going into this space just because I want to learn. I want to see what I can get out of it. So in a company, we might have three or four people look into a new project and they don't have to live by the old rules. They don't have to be compensated by the old rules. They don't have to have the same benefits as the old rules. They don't have to have the same office structure, working hours, uh, job descriptions. They can, it's white space. They can do whatever they want. You know, Virgin's a great example of this. Virgin started as a distributor of records back in, in, uh, in Peterborough, England. And then Sir Richard Branson went from distributing records by mail order to opening some retail stores. And, uh, you know, that worked out pretty well, too, selling records. But then he decided to open an international airline. Just like that. I mean, he was opening the store in, in Times Square and he was sort of like, you know, why would why would British Airways own the London to New York route? We know people want to travel. Let's do something new. So you put together a team and say, look, figure out how I could go open up an airline, you know, with no money, because th that's not the business we're in. And, you know, with that sort of thinking, you know, he unleashed Virgin. And now Virgin's a collection of over 100 companies and he's worth over nine billion dollars. And about three months ago, he went on a space flight, which was a, what's a white space project that was started 22, 23 years ago, right? You know, could we send a person into space? That was a white space project that, that Virgin created. It became Virgin Galactic. And, and now look what they've accomplished. So that's the Phoenix principle. If you want to be like, like Virgin and you want to have these new businesses you want to grow, then you got to have external data coming in. You've got to be constantly thinking about what the new little guy is doing. You've got to be willing to disrupt your business model and disrupt the world around you. And then you got to have people practicing it. You got to have people out there in these spaces that are trying to do new things all the time. If you follow those four steps, honestly, like a Phoenix, like the, the bird, the Phoenix, you know, it, it would crash, but it always came back again. You can actually, you can avoid the crash if you want to. The thing is you can just keep flying and you can keep growing. You know, you won't become a Sears if you follow those practices. 
Wonderful. So uh, one of the reasons uh, why I wanted you to come to the show is because you are very unique. And so uh, I'm, I'm talking to the audience in general. So usually when you talk to someone who is in the strategy consulting, they say, situation, success. And then there, there are no, no steps in between. Uh, so folks, I, I really invite you uh, to please uh, pause uh, and do take a moment so uh, he mentioned two things. So the Phoenix uh, and, of course, the status quo risk management playbook. Actually, he teaches you. He created this methodology. It's in four phases, you know, identifying and assessing the risks and pressure testing and adapting the planning and addressing the risk. But the model, he didn't keep it to himself. He shared it. And I invite you to go, please, to sparkpartners.com. It's free. Uh, he posted in there. You can learn about the model. And actually, there's training. So uh, he's not just saying you, there's a fish in the ocean. He's actually going to teach you how to fish. And if you need you know, uh, additional support, Spark Partners is there for you. So it's important that we, we tell uh, strategists one from the other. There's some people who talk a lot. And there's some people like Adam here who actually hold your hand, help you think through it, teach you the methodology teach you the thought process and they will walk the mile on your shoes so you you don't get empty-handed uh stuff you'll get a uh, real real methodologist and someone uh, who is actually actually there for you uh, i wanted to uh change subjects a little bit because you wrote quite a lot about and you're very passionate about leadership so let me go back to the the same situation turbulent um, volatile times that that we are all living not not just in the U.S. but elsewhere as well. So, what uh, leadership traits uh, do you consider key to ensure the firm's success in this type of environment? Well, it's all adap adaptability. You have to be mentally agile and you have to be adaptable. There is no particular um, strategy uh, that's going to constantly work in the future. Okay, you have to be willing to change sort of at a moment's notice in order to get things done. And so the leaders that are really successful today are the ones that are able to see what's happening and make those adjustments in order to be adaptable around what's going to happen in the future. Too often leaders say, I got successful doing A or I got successful doing B or, you know, I came up through finance, I came up through operations. This is what I know how to do. And they want to apply that. They constantly want to do what they did in the past. And that will get you into trouble every time. Um, just take a look at, you know, Sears was a tr company that was in, in trouble and it got acquired. And uh, the guy who was running it had run Western Auto and he was a, a, a private equity guy. And he said, I'm going to take my skill set. I want to apply it to Sears. And it took him 10 years to annihilate it and kill it. And now it's gone. Um, he didn't do a bad job at doing what he set out to do. He just did the wrong thing. He applied what had worked in the past at a time when retail was going through a significant transition and it wasn't going to work going forward. And so he was not adaptable and therefore it killed the company. So the number one thing that leaders have to have today is this ability to adapt to the changing environment in which they operate. Wonderful. So I uh, just want to uh, change subjects a little bit. And you are a certified board leadership fellow by the National Association of Corporate Directors, the NACD. Uh, the NACD values inclusion. They actually have the Center for Inclusive Governance. Uh, so in your view, uh, what is the business case for inclusiveness or is inclusiveness good for business? Well, it's, it's, it's actually a requirement today. Uh, and again, it gets this, uh, get away from this idea of groupthink. Uh, a lot of people have this mindset, you know, like, I can remember in my career that they would say, this is the culture of our company and we hire for culture. And almost every company that did that is now gone. Why? Because they said, we want everybody in the company to look like us, to think like us. So we have a common group think. Well, that might be good for productivity. It might be good to make sure everybody makes the same decision over and over. It's terrible for adaptability because now everybody's like, everybody's the same. So the more you have inclusion in your organization, the more likely you will be adaptable the more likely you will see things coming from different vectors. So, you know, if, if I, I think, again, looking back historically in America, when you had organizations run all by white men and they had a certain fairly common background, they got themselves into trouble as the world changed, right? 
So when you improve your inclusiveness, when you when you look at more ethnicities, when you look at uh, bringing uh, different people who think differently into your organization, you will be more successful because you will have more external eyes. They will bring more external data in. They come from a different place, so they're getting different inputs. They're getting different sensors. Then they can bring that to the organization. Now, when you have the discussion, they discuss it in different ways. They're by, when you have three people and they all have a different set of biases, you're going to get a better outcome. If the three people have similar biases, they may get along really well, but they're not going to see the need to change and they're not going to be willing to change. So inclusiveness improves all of those factors. And you desperately need it the higher you get in an organization. The C-level suite, the board of directors, these need to be very different people that can talk to each other and see things in different ways. That's the only way you're going to be able to break out of doing the same thing over and again and start to make some disruptive behaviors and start to actually deal with these external data to, to create a better future. Yeah, so this is more eyes and different eyes looking at the at the issues. So um, I wanted to go to uh, one other of your statements. So you said, uh, if you don't prepare for your future and change the game, someone else will do it for you. So so where do we start? How, how do we prepare for the future? And actually, can you tell us a little bit about Think Innovation? Well, okay. Think Innovation is the course. I, I took advantage of the pandemic. Um, <laughs> a lot of my work, almost all of my work was Adam Hartung interacting with people with the, you know, talking about the future, where should they go? Uh, and most of that prior to 2020 was done with me being on site, you know, I'd go to a company, I would go to give a presentation, the pandemic hit, all that activity stopped, we had to you know, take a break, sit back, we're not going to be able to interact the way we did before, it took a while to bring up the zoom meetings and the, and the digital technology space like we're working in now, I took that gap and sat down with uh, Manny Turan. And we said, look, let's take what Adam Hartung has been doing for 20 years around trends. And let's put that into a course. And uh, we didn't quite realize how big it was going to become. It became, I think, 26 modules, 26 video modules. But it's really, a, you know, Think Innovation is this course that, you, that walks you through looking at, at the external world, collecting data, identifying trends, applying those trends to the world around you, figuring out what disruptions are going to happen, figuring out how to have that impact on your own organization, as well as external organization, how to raise money, how to set up a white space team, how to manage a white space team. All of that's built into that course. And so you can go to the Spark Partners website and you can get that course. And, and actually, you don't even need Adam Hartung. You can buy that. You could go through it yourself, you can self pace. I would think it would take anybody six months to work their way through it because one of the things I know is that as you work through the modules, you'll get to module six and you'll say, wow, what I'm doing now. I really need to go back and do module two and three again because my learning gets better. So I have to kind of cycle back and go through it. So I don't think anybody could get through it in less than six months. But and then obviously, if you needed some help, you can always give us a call. and We'll help you with any if you get stuck along the way. So the Think Innovation course is out there so that people can start saying, how do I get going? Well, you start by collecting external data. You start by looking at external trends and then you apply those into your business. And so the idea of the Think Innovation course is it's the tool. It's taking it, moving beyond how does Adam Hartung think in a real world situation where you're interacting with me and says, how would Adam Hartung approach this problem? It gives you the tools so that you can start to do what I've been talking about here. And, you know, it, it's all a matter of education. You know, I didn't, I wasn't born looking at the external world. I wasn't born, you know, thinking that strategy uh, had to be externally oriented, but I learned that and I learned about ad adaptability. And that's the, what the, the Think Innovation course is. It's a tool that can help you learn how to reframe what you think about strategy, reframe how you think about your company or your organization, and then go out and build that future. Wonderful. So uh, I got a, a couple more comments. Uh, anything that uh, caught your eye at the CS? I think the show just uh, ended uh, over the weekend and we used to expect that uh, for quite some time, but anything particular caught your eye? Uh, yeah. The first thing was that it happened. Okay. <laughs> I um, And I don't say that because of the pandemic. What I think we're coming to get a good realization around is the fact that that method of communicating with people is really pretty out of date. Um, you know, the idea that we would have some giant conference that would fill up a bunch of buildings in some remote location, and we're going to go wander through these buildings and randomly look at technologies and figure out what's going to be the next big thing is pretty wildly out of date. And I just 
I'm just struck by the people who spent money to be there. And I'm struck by people who spend money to go because it's lazy. I mean, it's really lazy to think that I'm going to wander through some buildings and get something out of this. If you really want to know what's going on, you really would just be better appraised to keep yourself aware of what's going on with the investment community, where VCs and private equity people putting their money, keeping abreast of these technologies and reading about them, using the Internet, using the tool that's in front of you, right, to go ahead and get more information out of it. So it's not an issue of identifying the technology of the future because there's, you know, a thousand of them that have a very good probability of making some good improvements. You know, I'm I'm really into biopharma these days because we're going to, you know, chemical computing is on its way and and biopharma solutions are going to replace pharmacological solutions and medicine is going to change. And I'm into that in a big way and I'm studying it. But, you know, do I go to some place like CES where I'm going to get, you know, just the icing on the cake? No, that, that's not a good way to get that information. So I like the question. I'm glad somebody brought it up. Um, I just would be shocked if CES um, continues for another decade. So I remember the old uh, computer magazines that were like this thick, like the, the, <laughs> the phone book catalog. And now I don't even think they, they exist anymore. We have like, I don't know how many questions, especially because you mentioned the, the trend, the aging or the graying of America. And some people are concerned that, you know, the, uh, so if I understood the comments correctly, uh, so sometimes a virtual healthcare is possible, but sometimes such in the case of Alzheimer's or uh, mental illness may not be so applicable. So we still kind of need to be at the office or it requires more than Alexa uh, to help with Alzheimer's. We got lots of uh, comments uh, and I, I, it's not fair for me to ask you about the metaverse in 30 seconds, but they're, they're concerned about that. So they're concerned about esports and, and the changing. I think uh, you kind of hit a chord in there, people are saying, and especially because, especially here in the West and maybe in California as well, but here in Arizona, we got a lot of ads for uh, uh, for betting companies. So they're kind of invading the market and you can bet in virtually, uh, <laughs> virtually anything really. Uh, so uh, I guess I will just ask you, uh, um, one final question, which is uh, what really excites you about the future? Um, it, I think that in the future, people will be able to be their, their true selves in a way that they couldn't in the past. Um, you know, in my generation and, and before you were born and you were often judged on how you looked, uh, how tall you were, uh, how you spoke. Um, there's a lot of things about us that, that would, people would judge us on very, very quickly. You know, you go for a job interview and very quickly someone's assessing you based upon these factors. What I love about that whole ball of things you talked about is that in the future, we aren't limited by those. You know, uh, it, it, I, I can project myself across an Internet website the way I want to project myself. I can tell my story the way I want to tell my story. And the metaverse is going to make that even more clear. You know, if I'm if I'm very thoughtful about who I want to be, I can create myself in that context. Now, could you do this illicitly? Could you try to cause harm with it? Absolutely. But the the positive side is really very much there. Um, and and uh, that's one of the things I love about esports. You know, uh, there were kids that I grew up with that just weren't gifted, physically gifted, and and sometimes you know they couldn't hit a baseball real well or something like that, and and they might not be popular, and they might not you know they'd have problems because of that. But that kid might love baseball, just love it with a passion. Well, you know, esports allows them to go be a passionate baseball player, even if their their physical abilities won't allow them to compete. You know, at a Hank Aaron, well, not showing my age, <laughs> at a level of a professional player. Um, so the, the opportunity to be your true self is what you should be excited about with these technologies. And the, and the thing that you can rely upon is that so many other things that you had to spend time on are going to become robotized. They're going to become solved with machine learning and AI so that you can put your mind and your energy into the things that are really interesting for you and help you move forward. And at the end of the day, allowing you to have the interactions you want to have. You know, if you want to have a lot of interactions virtually, you'll be able to. If you want to have interactions physically, you'll be able to. But the, the thing is, is that historically we could only have them one way. We could only have the physical world. We could only have, you know, the that one way of interacting with people. Now you're going to have other ways to interact. 
Um, I, I just look at the life of Stephen Hawking. You know, he was a very blessed individual. Uh, you know, had he been born in a different place, different time, he could have suffered a, a horrible life. But because of the tools that he was able to to get, because of where he was born, where he was educated, how his illness developed, he was able to have a fantastic life. He was able to project himself out in the world. He was able to add a lot, even as his physical capabilities deteriorated. That separation of who he was, Stephen Hawking that we know, and the Stephen Hawking that was you know, physically struggling, the fact that those were two different things has helped us as a world in a big way. And all of us are going to be reaching that point where we can separate between the physical limitations we have and who we want to be, and we can create ourselves into the person that we want the world to see. And I think that's a very exciting thing. Wow. Uh... Oof. Uh, so, you know, I I guess I have a boatload more questions to ask of you, but I'm afraid I, I, I can't ask you for more. It was uh, such a great talk. I, I don't know how to thank you, Adam, you know, for, for taking the time. And I, I really um, hope to see you again soon. And folks, as a reminder, uh, don't forget to visit, you know, Adam's site, sparkpartners.com, adahartum.com. His own podcast is fantastic. It, it's worthwhile. Uh, the site is, is full of information, training opportunities, learning opportunities. There's just uh, so much more. And, and I uh, hope uh, you can come back some other time so we, we can, can talk a little bit more. <laughs> it was a pleasure and I look forward to it someday. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you. Okay, folks. So, so let's go back to our uh, agenda. What did we do today? So uh, we just finished talking with Adam. Uh, I kind of uh, went a little bit overboard in terms of the timing. He was very patient and looked at the questions and, and the answers and he took care of them. Uh, so I'm afraid I can't uh, save any more time for additional Q&As. But again, feel free to uh, leave the comments on the YouTube if you're watching us or as a recording or through Futures Television. Uh, just go to our YouTube page and leave it on the comment section. And again, uh, adamhartman.com, sparkpartners.com. Uh, so I think uh, we have to talk a little bit about uh, our upcoming events. Yes, yes. I hope you guys come back. So next, we're going to talk about sense making with Sango and Chris Bromley. They're going to be two very different perspectives on yet just one topic. Dr. Marie Rafaker will be here uh, to talk with us. She's a fantastic podcaster out of Berlin. Several authors are coming. Finally, Joyce is coming to see us. And Eugene Ivanov, among others, uh, he has an interesting book coming out. We will continue on the topics of technology, the metaverse, and sustainability. Several events. Uh, so Markets and Markets uh, has a new one. Frost and Sullivan has one in, in February about innovation. So it's going to be a whole show about innovation. And the Institute of Competitive Intelligence out of Frankfurt has a lot of new things um, us to talk about so uh, really i need to uh, start by thanking you again thank you so very much for your presence and participation in the show today you can always reach out to the magazine or to me via facebook linkedin twitter youtube and i, I really hope to see you again soon again thank you adam so much for your taking the time to be with us and i will leave you with our institutional message Thank you.